AMD. At work in your life. I feel like most people have that one friend. They're the one friend that will always pick the underdog in a fight. They rewatch Rocky II a million times and they will constantly tell you how iPhones are the worst option. If you're involved in the PC world at all, that friend is usually the person who's always defending one company. Nowadays, the tech industry is dominated by a handful of giants, large corporations like Intel, Nvidia, Apple, and that friend's favorite underdog. AMD. But to explain the underdog story of AMD, you have to rewind way back before the Ryzen series CPUs, before Radeon graphics cards, and even before the company itself was created, all the way back to Jerry Sanders. The founder. Jerry Sanders was born on September 12th, 1936. You might be wondering why he was born. Well, when a mommy and a daddy really love each other. Whoa, wait, wait, wait. Too far back? Ah. Uh... I got you, I got you, I got you. We'll, we'll speed it up. Jerry Sanders came from a rough home life and entered adulthood eager to prove himself. In 1958, he graduated from the University of Illinois with a degree in electrical engineering. He was immediately recruited by Douglas Aircraft Company, but quickly took interest in the sales side of tech and was soon hired by Motorola. Sanders quickly became salesman of the year at Motorola and started earning a reputation in the tech community. In 1961, Sanders was poached by Fairchild Semiconductor, the first semiconductor company. Tangent time! Fairchild Semiconductor is actually super important here because they are kind of the, the granddaddy of all big tech companies. Both AMD and Intel came out of Fairchild along with a bunch of other companies that don't matter because they're dead and gone. Tangent over. Take it over, regular Kyle. Thanks, Tangent Kyle. Now back to what I was saying. Sanders found himself as the national marketing director for Fairchild before he even hit 30 years old. Obviously he was doing something right, but Fairchild Child as a company had issues. Production had run late a couple times, and semiconductor technology was still in its infancy. Fairchild hit a steady decline, and this ultimately accumulated in Sanders being laid off. He took his severance and rode off into the sunset, still hungry to prove himself. Do you feel that? That's that's, oh, oh my God, not again. Tangent time. Right as Fairchild was hitting its decline, two employees by the name of Robert Nice and Gordon Moore decided to leave and start their own tech company. Believing that there was space for them and thrive and learn from Fairchild's mistakes, they started a little company called Intel. Obviously, Intel needs no introduction here, and <gasps> you bet they will come up again. Take that away, regular Kyle. Thanks, Tangent Kyle. While starting up was easy for Intel, Sanders had a harder time laying the groundwork for what would become a AMD. Intel just had to make a couple of calls and they had their costs covered. They were able to snatch up some government contracts and got started before the tech industry hit a bit of a lull. Sanders, on the other hand, started the process of building his new company right as the tech industry hit a decline. After hitting roadblock after roadblock, he finally secured funding and Advanced Micro Devices was incorporated on May 1st, 1969. Nice. Their first headquarters wasn't even its own building. It was in the back of a rug cutting company. Also, the name Advanced Micro Devices wasn't even the first name the team chose due to trademark issues. It was actually the 17th choice. Ironic given how recognizable AMD is today. Sanders based his entire marketing strategy off the same thing that drove his career, being an underdog. The first ever AMD advertisement wasn't about the product they created or the science behind it. It was about the people who founded AMD. Flash forward to the mid 70s and AMD had been operating as a second source manufacturer. AMD would take designs that other companies had created and manufacture more of them. Essentially, Sanders and AMD had found a way to copy everyone's homework and make money off of it. They kind of became the tech industry's best cover band. Instead of reinventing the wheel, they took what already worked and aimed to make the highest quality version of it. If Fairchild released something like this UA741 chip, AMD conveniently would have an AM741 chip releasing shortly after. And they would do this for Intel chips as well. Anytime Intel created a new chip, AMD would reverse engineer it. While they did create the occasional proprietary piece of tech, most of the company's income came from this second source method. While AMD wasn't the biggest innovator in the early days, the marketing strategy here was genius. AMD would eventually move away from reverse engineering other companies' products, but they wouldn't quite escape Intel's shadow. Here is where things get juicy. Intel and AMD agreed to license each other's products in 1976. This meant no more taking pictures of a chip 
than reverse engineering. They would just have to share each other's designs and both companies would profit. That being said, Intel was still the industry leader and both companies would continue to directly compete with each other. If you ask someone who the top chip manufacturer was back then, they wouldn't have hesitated in saying Intel. As for AMD, well, as always, they were the underdog. For years, it seemed like Intel and AMD would continue to share designs and architectures. That was until the 80s. One day, in a passion and cocaine-fueled rage, the Intel CEO decided enough was enough, and AMD would not get their specs for the new i386 chip Intel was creating, thus ending their uneasy relationship. Kidding. Don't know, actually, if the Intel CEO did cocaine. He probably did, maybe, I don't know, but that was exciting, right? But Intel really did just stop sharing all the details on their processors, which left AMD right back where they started, reverse engineering Intel's products. This is where AMD had their Rocky III moment. They realized they had to go on the next level on proprietary hardware. Sure, they had made processors before, but nothing like the K5. The K5 processor was direct competition to the original Pentium, and it did wonders for AMD. The subsequent K6 and its iterations that released through the 90s would close the gap between AMD and Intel like never before. Plus, it was compatible with Intel's motherboards. Wild, right? You'd never get that nowadays. Jerry Sanders continued his position as CEO through these years, constantly keeping the spirit that he started the company with. Looking back, it was clear that his goal was to surpass Intel, not only in sales, but in also public perception. Ultimately, he wouldn't see that goal while CEO because he stepped down in 2002, but Sanders had something massive cooking leading up to his departure. After years of being the underdog, AMD finally did it with the Athlon 64. The Athlon 64 was released in 2003, a year after Sanders left, and it was the first processor capable of 64-bit processing. While that is an achievement itself, the best part was that Intel actually licensed the design from AMD to create the 64-bit processors themselves. While Sanders was no longer CEO, he got the last laugh from the sideline. After years of hard work and an uphill battle against Intel, Sanders had taken AMD from a second source Intel production company to a full-blown rival that pushed the industry leader to innovate. While this battle between Intel and AMD was commencing through the 90s and 2000s, another market was appearing in tech. A new age was approaching, the age of the graphics card. Graphics card were a new and risky technology. NVIDIA, who you've no doubt heard of, was just starting up in 96, and by 99, they had invented the world's first graphics processing unit. Tangent time! It turns out that NVIDIA is a dirty, nasty liar. That's right, their pants are on fire. Ooh. <sighs> NVIDIA didn't actually create the first GPU. They just created the name graphics processing unit and the rest of the industry went, wait, I like that. 3DFX and their Voodoo cards were technically the first GPUs. They were just called 3D graphics cards before NVIDIA. All right, tangent over. All right, thank you, Tangent Kyle. Once again, man, I hate that guy. GPUs or graphics cards became increasingly popular going into the late 90s and early 2000s, especially with the rise of consoles and 3D gaming. Nvidia ended up acquiring 3DFX and getting access to all sorts of technology, namely SLI. We did a video on that, so click the link in the description to check that out. By the early 2000s, Nvidia and ATI were really the only competition in the graphics card market. ATI was a Canadian semiconductor company that started in the 80s and it quickly became a mainstay in the GPU market. One of their more notable moments was when they released their first Radeon graphics card. Yes, you heard me right, that. Radeon graphics card. Bear with me, ATI will be important in a second here. By the time 2006 rolled around, AMD was not doing great. Hector Ruiz, the newly installed CEO, tried his best, but Intel was once again in the lead. AMD with Ruiz as the head had decided they wanted to gain a foothold above Intel and not just in the CPU market, so they bought ATI for $5.6 billion. AMD was now a major player in more than just the CPU market, and Intel was nowhere close to keeping up on the GPU department. Let's be real, even today, Intel can't keep up with the GPU industry, but maybe Intel's upcoming Battlemage lineup will change that. AMD, on the other hand, had entered a new era 
with the acquisition of ATI and Radeon. In the late 2000s to the early 2010s, AMD hit a bit of a wall with product consistency and some awful optimization with their graphics cards. Intel continued to maintain the lead in the CPU market and admittedly made better processors at the time. There were some notable moments like the release of six core processors, but Intel was always there to match and surpass. AMD's leadership was also looking bleak with Ruiz leaving in 2008 and his replacement Dirk Meyer only staying for a short time. Meyer wasn't a bad CEO, but AMD didn't see any massive growth until 2014. In 2014, AMD announced their newest and arguably best CEO to date, Lisa Su. Lisa Su is regarded as the reason AMD is still here today. You know the Ryzen chips? like the series of processors that AMD is known for now? Well, in 2014, those didn't exist. That was Lisa Su's brainchild. For context, Lisa Su has a bachelor's, master's, and doctorate degree in electrical engineering. She spent her entire career in the semiconductor industry and was eager to take the position as AMD's CEO, even though the company was heading towards bankruptcy. Once again, AMD found itself an underdog eager to prove itself leading the company. Sue's tactic that saved the company was centered around the future. Artificial intelligence, high performance processors, and graphics cards were now the main focus of AMD. The first real win for AMD under Lisa Sue's leadership was the launch of the now industry leading Ryzen chips. For the first time, AMD was outpacing Intel by a larger margin in performance. The Ryzen 7 1800X delivered 25% more multi-core throughput than the Intel i7-6850K that launched around the same time. Examples like this became more and more common as Lisa Su's version of AMD continued to forge on. On the graphics card front, AMD and Radeon had massive issues after ATI's purchase in 2006. Graphics drivers and performance were just not up to snuff, especially when competing with Nvidia. While AMD was figuring out how to deliver a product that customers could rely on, Nvidia was unveiling ray tracing to the world. While Nvidia is far and away the leader in graphics card technology today, AMD has corrected errors with drivers and become a really solid option as compared to before. Radeon launched the RX 7900 XTX in 2022, which can actually outperform Nvidia's counterpart, the RTX 4080, in some cases. Sure, AMD isn't the industry leader in GPUs today, but they have a track record of surprises. On the CPU side, AMD is now the industry leader and they have Lisa Su to thank for it. In 2022, AMD's stock price surpassed Intel and it didn't last for long, but the point was made. An underdog became an industry leader. If you ask people nowadays whether Intel or AMD delivers a better product, you won't always get the same answer. The gap between these two tech giants is the smallest it has ever been. Intel is great at creating raw power and charging high prices. But AMD has honed in on the gaming market and has pushed forward integrated graphics technology by a large margin. And don't even get me started on their thread rippers. Xbox and PlayStation have been using AMD GPUs for years, and several successful handheld gaming platforms have used AMD APUs. The narrative used to be Intel charges a premium for a reason. Even though you're paying a significant amount more, it's that much better. Today, that argument doesn't ring as true as it used to. Intel's price difference just doesn't justify the tiny bit of extra performance you might get. And don't even get me started on Intel's recent increased failure rates on their higher end 13th and 14th gen SKUs. While the battle to catch up with Intel is well, basically over, AMD still has one big adversary, Nvidia. Nvidia, without question, produces better GPUs. The price difference is there, and Nvidia in some cases arguably overcharges for their GPUs, but the argument here is that the price difference reflects how much better Nvidia cards are. Sounds familiar. Right? I believe that the battle between NVIDIA graphics cards and Radeon graphics cards is a similar story to Intel and AMD. AMD may be behind now, and it may even seem like they won't catch up, but they have a track record to make me think otherwise. AMD may not surpass NVIDIA today, tomorrow, a year, hell, even more. But if you pay attention to their history and the principles that they were built on, there's zero chance that they will give up because they've spent 55 years proving to the tech industry that a company that started in the back of a rug shop is coming 
for their asses. Guys, thank you so much for watching. Please like and subscribe to our channel. We're thinking about doing more content like this where we're getting into the intricacies of businesses in the tech industry. We're thinking maybe, I don't know, EVGA, Intel, NVIDIA. If you like what we do, let us know. If you have questions, let us know. If there's certain things you'd like to see, let us know. Thanks.